Hi, I'm uh, Jaromil. We are using a radically different technical approach for our architecture. It sounds uh, pretty much a, a kumbaya moment if I describe it like this. The economy has focused a lot on innovating through creating startups. In Europe, this has been uh, mildly a failure, I believe. Open source hardware is um, as important, if not more nowadays, than open source software. One day, maybe we can even repair our washing machines if uh, all this will be open source. The vision in our work uh, in Interfacer is uh, to change uh, a bit the game, indeed. Welcome to the second episode of the Interfacer series of the Fab City Hamburg podcast. This time we have a very, very, very interesting guest with us is Jeremy, director of Dine.org. He and his team are technical coordinators in the Interfacer project. I was really fascinated and Jeremy has a lot to say to our future economy, complementary currency systems, the future open source hardware and things we actually can do. So again, it would mean the world to me if you could rate or review this content and share this wherever you can. The things Jeremy said are super interesting and important. Jeremy also mentioned a lot of authors you can discover in the show notes. So let's jump right in. Okay. Who's that, Jeremy? Who's, who's that on the picture? The guy. It's uh, Alan Turing. This is a portrait by a painter that I bought. Uh, yeah, I think it's a representative of my work. I work in cryptography, and he is one of the most famous cryptographers of the last century. Okay, let's start. So please explain to us, what is your role in the interface project? We are technical coordinators of the project and uh, we are working to develop uh, both uh, its uh, uh, infrastructure online, its cryptographic model, economic model and implementation of the digital product passport. We are very passionate about what we do and we are very happy to put our technical knowledge to serve the purpose of circular economy projects like Interfacer. How would you describe your profession? In uh, Dynorg, we practice a lot of interdisciplinarity. So none of us is just an expert in one area, and we thrive by making sure that we all know what is happening uh, a, on each other's desk. So uh, my professional profile uh, may be confused as uh, that of many others in this project. I'm trained as a philosopher. I work as a cryptographic uh, uh, applied uh, uh, cryptography developer since more than 10 years. And I'm directing uh, Dynorg through European uh, research and development projects in the last 10 years, mostly focusing on data sovereignty and circular economy. Before Interfacer, we completed a success story project for the European Commission called Reflow which is feeding a lot of uh, the technical developments also in Interfacer and applied to Hamburg. And uh, well, uh, if you ask me what is my job, I think uh, uh, it's just like yours, uh, being passionate about what we do, because this is halfway to success. I didn't know that you, you said you're a philosopher, right? I yeah, completed my uh, doctorate in philosophy in uh, University Plymouth. So the dissertation is titled Algorithmic Sovereignty, which became a hot topic uh, later on. And uh, I'm, I'm blown away by the fact that it's the most viewed uh, uh, doctoral thesis in the world, Plymouth University, which is a pretty big public university. What is Stein doing in, in developing FAPCDS and what is the goal? In, um, in the Interfacer project, uh, uh, we are very happy to uh, cooperate with Fab City Hamburg. In a city like Hamburg, where uh, uh, the, the movement of the open source hardware is growing at a faster speed, probably, than, than uh, many other places in Europe. And we are looking at practical cases to empower these situations. So, first of all, what are the challenges of people working in a networked environment? Uh, trying to leverage skills of different people towards goals that are uh, uh, production ready, they are uh, sustainable in terms of economy, and they are useful for uh, participants and users that uh, want new products. What does this mean is uh, we are trying to power up this uh, uh, concept of a diffuse industry 
where designers can contribute to each other works, just like developers do already on uh, source code, but uh, on uh, open hardware. And to do this, we need to standardize the processes and protocols of communication, also the formats of designs. And uh, we try to put also this uh, uh, movement of designers, distributed the design movement in touch with people able to produce the designs. So, for example, uh, if I am very good with a 3D printer, a laser cutter, and perhaps a milling machine, then I can download the design of the Interfacer platform from FabCDOS and uh, realize it uh, as a concrete object and even sell it over an e-commerce or uh, over my own uh, connections, over my shop. We want this to happen and we want uh, producers that engage with this uh, community flow to be able also to give back the wealth they create with this last mile of production and bringing to shop. So we want uh, to create also an economic incentive for designers to contribute their designs and uh, to offer even help and support to people producing them into objects. We are talking about uh, hardware here. And it can go a long way because uh, if you consider how many small boxes, uh, uh, also like a, a simple computer, like a Raspberry Pi worth uh, around 30 euros, if programmed with certain software and networked with sen certain sensors and hardware can be useful, can uh, make a product that solves a lot of automations. One day, maybe we can even repair our washing machines and uh, uh, more even appliances at home if uh, all these will be open source. So the vision is that of opening up the field of intervention for uh, uh, designers, the field of intervention for people producing the hardware, and uh, insert this dynamic into uh, an ecology of open source products. I say ecology, maybe stretching the meaning of the word, but I try to uh, highlight the fact that what we are doing aims at sustainability in an environmental sense. If the appliances, for instance, that we all have at home and we depend upon for our daily life will be open source, then we would have, again, the little shops that can repair them uh, uh, on, on our streets rather than uh, uh, being desperate, uh, trying to get rid of uh, old hardware uh, as soon as a circuit uh, uh, breaks and buying a whole new appliance. So we try to also facilitate the rec recyclability of objects. To do that, we also develop a digital product passport, which is an authenticated method to trace uh, what uh, are the components uh, that make an object. So for instance, we can uh, uh, take apart a uh, uh, one, one of the uh, small and medium enterprises we have been in touch, they are uh, doing uh, compost toilets for camping and for events. They are make of, made of many parts. There is uh, ventilation, there are uh, the, 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 the wooden parts that make them, and they need to make sure that these parts have a lifespan uh, they need to predict eventually if they will break or not. They need to take them apart and recompose them by changing the parts that are too old or breaking up, but uh, reusing the parts that are still good. So a uh, digital product passport allows a company like this to take uh, uh, keep track of the objects, not only of the designs, of the components, of the hardware components, that are part of the, the whole product. So take them apart, put them back. And um, this is a sort of passport. And we are passionate about it because it's not for people. Uh, in fact, at Dine, we believe in uh, free circulation and opening up uh, uh, the, the borders. But we want to keep track of objects as much as possible because they are ending up cluttering our lives and our living spaces and also creating most problems in disposal and recycling. So a company then can itself take care of the circularity of its own activities this way. And uh, it is a simple uh, thing. It can be a QR code sticker on the object, but behind it, the, there is the whole tree of history. And it's like a tree. 
uh, if you see the object on top or on the bottom, there is a tree of parts and designs that compose it. And uh, this, uh, this is what we visualize with a digital uh, product passport. Accidentally, in uh, such a tree of uh, history of an object, you can also see the people that have contributed to it and where the parts came from. So we believe that this is a very interesting approach, not only for the open hardware industry, but also for the food industry and for every other vertical in society that uh, wants to track better their objects. So it's a, it's a, new, it's a new dimension for the logistics uh, uh, software of the future. Actually, it's a huge concept. Could you please tell us who's involved in this and where does it come from? The digital product passport uh, is not uh, uh, something I invented or we invented at Dyn at all. We are proposing a cryptographic model for authenticating it. But the concept of a digital product passport uh, is something that a lot of people in Europe are looking at. Uh, I believe those that are looking in the right direction to really improve our society. There are many industries that are trying to establish a standard. We count more than 200 standard proposals uh, in Europe for uh, this. And I do know that the European Commission has a high priority of establishing a standard for the single market to adopt uh, a common digital product passport. So uh, we are uh, one of the many players in this game. Uh, our approach is to do everything free and open source and to be purpose driven. So we are happy to work with our colleagues in Hamburg to apply immediately the ideas, to model them, to pilot them and to see on the field how they go. In this uh, way, I, I guess uh, also our colleagues from the new production institute are ideal partners, as the name says, they are focused on production. Hmm. Uh, one thing that I like to say about this uh, concept for the scientists out there, I believe that uh, it should be based on a graph. What does this mean is that all data that we represent is in a graph and relations count more than single nodes. And these relations need to be governed by a vocabulary. So we are far from building an ontology, but we are getting there and we are building a vocabulary that can describe relationships. These relationships are between uh, resources, events, and agents. And uh, any resource can be consumed or produced out of an event with agents intervening. And this way we describe uh, a whole uh, tree, a whole uh, uh, cosmos, a whole city of interaction. Okay, basically what you are describing is a track and trace of the resources, events and agents of open source hardware. You're breaking the concept down to three layers. This helps you deal with the complexity. Yes, this is also nothing that we have invented. The resource event agent uh, model is an accounting model. It has been mostly um, in theory, and it's a model of accounting for very complex networks. Uh, accounting, as in the sense of accounting for money, is done by a double bookkeeping, for instance. It's the most simple, so the checks match from what goes in and out. There are uh, many other ways to account, and uh, when it's more than money, it becomes more complex. In this case, it's super complex because we have uh, events uh, in which, again, agents, uh, which can be people mostly, interact or organizations, and then we have resources. So uh, the RIA model, in a brief, as an acronym REA, is uh, the paradigm of accounting we adopt. It's well discussed what solutions we need for our sustainability and production crisis. Tackling the way we do accounting is one of the major solutions we have, I think. And we want to change our accounting to fair accounting, also taking into account resources that we overlook for a long time, like water, air, and so on. And the way I understand it is that you want to apply this accounting by introducing this new digital product passport. You, you said it very well. We try to put into the picture to account for things that were overlooked. 
that were not part of equations uh, in previous accounting models. This is uh, um, a crucial thing to understand. Most people really want the best for the world around themselves. What happens is that we do not have a way to visualize, perceive, and account for what happens for every action, even in goodwill. So far, we have had a calculation over the performance of nation states based on the income of people. But this doesn't tell us about the well-being of people living in a place. And so when we go down in detail, it's definitely a problem when uh, we don't take into account what economists so far called externalities. We go farther into this because it's not only objects we take care for, but we work also on the level of a fab city. So um, a lab, um, it can be called in many ways. We have uh, hacker spaces, we have places of practice, pla places where people uh, share knowledge and production means for realizing projects, be them common or formed around a few group of people. And these places are also in the lens of the Interfacer project. We are developing an economic model. And the objective of this economic model is to take into account positive externalities. What we call positive externalities are things, uh, behaviors, cultural traits, dynamics, social dynamics that are not taken into account when we calculate the output of a place, when we calculate how much a place can earn or how much people can earn by being part of a company or an organization. These are the roles of people that maybe produce failures and uh, now and then produce successes, but still being around, they create a uh, ecosystem and uh, ambience that really helps people being creative. This is uh, mostly um, a positive externality because it produces a positive energy into places where it, where, where it acts, but is completely not accounted for. It sounds uh, pretty much a, a kumbaya moment if I describe it like this, like uh, let's uh, love uh, and uh, flower power. But uh, I can tell you um, a concrete examples uh, and especially the way we do it. Um, what we want to uh, do uh, for uh, places like fab cities where designers and producers interact is a system that takes into account their activity. And their activity, be it on a project uh, uh, of the Fab City, a project that takes place in that place, so affects more people, that activity is a threshold. It's a level of threshold, at a, a minimum level of work that people can do around that place. If you pass that level of work, be it for a successful project or a less successful, a growing project, a new and old one, then you will perceive a basic income. So a basic part of what enters into that place. And then we zero those points because a new cycle, a new month can start in which other people may be active more or other people less. So this sort of creates a rational way to share what comes from the outside. If you remember, before I made an example, someone can go and produce a design. Let's say there is a group of designers that worked for 10 years on a design of a new bike, a very efficient bike and uh, unique. Let's say it goes with the wind. So uh, not even electric. Uh, after, uh, after 10 years, someone finds this design and starts selling it. Of course, this someone needs help, needs help for people to communicate the idea, um, for the marketing, for putting it on the shop, for the logistics, for the sales, not only for the design and realization. For all these things, this person will need help. When this person produces this thing and this thing becomes famous in all Hamburg because people love to go on wind bikes uh, across the streets of Hamburg, and a lot of money comes into this operation, what happens is not that just the person that had the idea to bring it to market will get the money. 
But through the digital product passport, we will be able to trace all the people that have uh, um, that have contributed to this design. That by contract, being used in production will be will have to be taken into account. We will reach these people and we will say, hey, your design that you put into the commons of this place can be rewarded now because something has came, came in. And in the meantime, we will also be able to split this reward among all people that have been active through the place, uh, promoting it and uh, keeping in touch. And also people that have been working on less uh, uh, successful projects that are still within the same place. And maybe we'll create the next uh, the next great idea of the future. So what we are trying to do is break out of this um, economy that uh, uh, just rewards uh, um, the bright entrepreneur, the protagonist of a story, and trying to really put an incentive for everyone to put their ideas and designs in common. Um, mm. This platform uh, will will make it easier, of course, to understand the mechanism because we have a onboarding platform where one can upload ideas, can import uh, Git repositories, and uh, these things can uh, can start rolling. When we talk about the Fab City operating system, we are talking about a systematic change, and we are talking about game changes. It's very hard to <laughs> create a game changer, and uh, a wishful thinking, of course. So uh, the vision in our work uh, in Interfacer is uh, to change uh, a bit the game, indeed. Uh, seeing it, seeing society in a, in a in a progressive and positive sense, we think that some uh, rules can be improved so that the game is more interesting for more people. Yeah, the game changer uh, in Interfacer, primarily from a social and economical point of view we believe uh, is the economic model uh, because um, the economy, at least in the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 years, has focused a lot on uh, um, innovating through creating startups. It imported this economic model from the US, um, a place that is culturally very different from Europe. Um, there is more investment flowing and philanthropy is uh, a model that substitutes uh, public uh, sector. Uh, in Europe, uh, this has been mildly a failure, I believe, and uh, it is not sustainable in the sense that startups constantly crunch people's life through um, high stress and uh, uh, KPIs that are only market-oriented. So we want to change this game and uh, having uh, uh, even more people playing it so not excluding those who have played, uh, excelled, and especially those who have failed into the startup economy. And let me say that the most people that participated to startup economies have failed. And this is not, I think, um, a reason to, to exclude them from, from uh, future games. Um, it, the game changer is speaking about inclusion and about uh, less uh, uh, profit-driven initiatives that, again, value uh, positive externalities like uh, a cultural production within the fabric of the city, the improvement of uh, a cultural environment and a social environment, and the production of uh, uh, objects, products, designs, and uh, digital uh, uh, services that uh, respect the environment. These are the variables that we want to put uh, into the game and we want to make them extremely important, even more important than the profit of a single person of, or of an investor was in the previous economy. Another game changer is the fact uh, uh, that we are using end-to-end -end cryptography. It's a little bit more technical as it sounds, um, it uh, rests into the context of uh, uh, technical sovereignty and digital sovereignty. And it is uh, very important because uh, it does not make us own your data. So we are building platforms that are not enclosing the data of participants into a silo. 
your desires, your needs, your log of usage, your history, be it on a platform like Uber or Tinder or Facebook or Instagram, is uh, then uh, siloed, it's controlled by the company that created these services. We are using a radically different technical approach for our architecture. First of all, it's federated, so you can add your own node. You can build a node, a new fab city with a collective in another city of Germany. You can open it in Halle, in, uh, uh, in Dortmund, in uh, Cologne, and then you get in touch with uh, each other and exchange data. So you have people traveling through and using machines with the same uh, user. Just like today is the Fediverse with Mastodon, which is uh, 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 substituting Twitter. And we use end-to-end -end encryption because uh, uh, your keys, like the secret keys you use to sign your actions on this platform, they are inside your mobile or inside your desktop. They are inside the browser. They are composed by a mnemonic seed, which is uh, created by answering five questions. And these five questions about your personal life, which are secrets to you, they create your um, seed your uh, password. So if you tell me I lost my password, can you reset it? I cannot, even on our system, because we don't have your passport, password on the system. You have to remember those five answers and recover yourself, your, uh, your, uh, your password. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible. So through a onboarding again, that is uh, quite comprehensible. But the concept is, is quite complex. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, you can follow uh, the difference between, uh, uh, oh, don't worry, we will help you and we will keep all your data safe. And no, one moment, my data is with myself. Even willing, you cannot sign in my name because my signature is not on your server, is in my wallet. So we created a wallet that is also ready to hold uh, crypto assets as well. We are not uh, using them in Interfacer, but the sort of technology is the same. And uh, we wish to leverage the potential of uh, crypto technologies, which has been uh, only deployed in the financial sector so far, a very toxic uh, vertical, in my opinion. We want to leverage the innovation of these technologies also in other verticals of society. These are very good news that we can see a concrete project that has a possibility of the systematic change. But let me ask you also why you think that the Fab City movement in particular is so interesting to you. The most interesting uh, part of the Fab City movement, I think, is that it has uh, a history in which uh, personally I can see a certain uh, coherence in, in my own participation. So I'm talking about the, the hacker movement, I'm talking about the makers movement, I'm talking about even like protest movements that have tried to fight the ongoing corporate exploitation of environment and creativity into a proprietary system. So what I call this movement is the commons movement. Eleanor Ahlstrom uh, uh, being the most famous uh, researcher into this. I think that uh, what makes uh, Fab Cities very interesting is this, is that they link to a history that makes value not out of scarcity, but out of abundance and participation. The vision is that we can produce and reproduce designs, and out of this will come wealth. And it's opposed to uh, uh, an industrial capitalist system that thrives on scarcity and uh, uh, privatization and intellectual property. In this sense, I find myself uh, at ease with a movement as the Fab City, also as an activist and as a person that believes that uh, societal change needs to be driven through our action, also professional action in our life. A lot of the things that Fab Cities are uh, talking about, they were envisioned by an economist, uh, uh, a bright economist uh, that uh, is worth uh, going back to study, Nicolas Georgescu-Rogan, 
from Romania back uh, already almost uh, now uh, 100 years ago, uh, started envisioning uh, the role of the second law of thermodynamics into economic systems, taking into account the entropy of systems, uh, economical systems. So the entropy is waste, but if we see entropy as something that we could uh, also not send just to waste, and again, as the second law of thermodynamics says, nothing really goes to waste, nothing disappears, it just transforms itself, eventually will come back. It just depends how much we are uh, able to deal with this transformation in a virtuous way that does not pollute our environment and serves our purposes. So seeing it this way, I think that uh, it becomes very interesting to talk about economics as a field that needs to improve itself uh, uh, and, and always look at improvement of systems. And again, not just, uh, 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 not just be at ease with profit and uh, uh, improve technologies that can deal with entropy in a more productive way. Thank you very much. My last question would be directed to a very controversial topic. And let me phrase it quite pessimistic. Isn't open source hardware to fail? Isn't it quite utopic? What would you say against it? Open source hardware is um, as important, if not more nowadays, than open source software. And um, being a software developer, I know very well that uh, our um, success in uh, sharing and uh, in open source dynamics is uh, benefiting a lot from the fact that we have very low marginal costs in communicating and in uh, shipping. Open hardware has the huge uh, challenge of moving uh, objects, things. So it's a huge marginal cost. And the cost is just growing with energy crisis and, uh, and the complexity of logistics. So I think that uh, we must be very careful when applying the visions of open source software to open hardware. The dynamics will be different and uh, a lot of research and um, yeah, a lot of uh, visions need uh, still to mature. Uh, it is not just the application of the same economy in the same situation. It is uh, translating it from digital to physical. It's uh, it's a big deal. And um, in doing so, I believe that it is important to think that the environment in which we inscribe these uh, dynamics is, uh, is uh, extremely uh, beneficial or, or, or represents a big problem for uh, the realization of an open source economy. In an environment in which the capital reigns with its investments and uh, uh, thrives out of scarcity, it will be very difficult to graft an operation that is based on open source principles. As an example, nowadays virtual uh, um, capital, uh, I say virtual because it's like printed out of uh, uh, nothing to uh, invest and buy entire nations is driven by venture capitals to buy out a whole operation that is uh, uh, in, in a certain territory, calculates the loss over years until the whole economy is deleted and then creates a new economy, which is a colonial, uh, basically, uh, operation. So this sort of virtualization of capital and, and investments is not an environment in which any open source can thrive. I can do all the good I want for a community, but when the small money that I ask for for, for my services is uh, uh, when the market is broken, because someone enters from the outside and asks one euro instead of uh, 10, then I will not be able to lead my economy forward because I'm a small fish and someone else comes from outside with uh, an enormous amount of resources just to delete the economy that I created. This happened all over Europe. Um, I've seen this happening in, in various uh, fields. I'm sure you have examples. So in this, uh, in the, in this framework, if you, we think of creating an economy that uh, uh, respects variety, and, uh, and people contributions and put in touch uh, grassroots communities, we are naive. 
we cannot thrive into the current uh, financial regime of uh, investments, of venture capital funding, and decontextualization and, and colonization of economies. So rather than taking a defensive stance, I like to be still uh, uh, looking at how to develop uh, grassroots economies that can thrive and defend themselves from outside influences. Therefore, I am a big fan of uh, complementary currency systems. And uh, here I can give you references to, I think, some of the best thinkers in the world uh, about these systems, uh, at least in contemporary times, who happen to be German, Margaret Kennedy. Uh, she comes from architecture, and I think it's not a coincidence, a field that builds architectures for people to live in and to, to develop a society. And she wrote a lot about complementary currencies and what they can do. And even on a deeper level, a more philosophical level, the work of Christina von Braun is also very interesting on um, money as a sacrifice and the dimension of its liturgy and what we can expect from the future. I make no uh, mystery. I'm a big critic of uh, uh, the politics uh, of uh, the IMF uh, and uh, of uh, uh, the handling of debts uh, uh, in a geopolitical sense. And um, I think that diversity in this sense just brings uh, more resiliency. If you ask mm -hmm. me about the larger picture, I believe uh, this is uh, a worthwhile attempt, at least to do in certain parts of our uh, society, because uh, it is a different approach and is not the dominant one. And the dominant one has been trying to delete every single attempt at uh, a complementary economy and the local economy development uh, so far. So it's, uh, it, it's a larger picture. Thank you very much. One last question. Feel free to answer just yes or no. Can we, our community, do it on our own? Or do we need a policy that changes the framework conditions? I would say no. I, I agree with you. We cannot do it on our own. No one can do it on their own. In a system in which we are, at least in Europe, completely right. dominated by uh, capital uh, uh, and the colonialism of capital and capitalism. Uh, we definitely need to think in a more holistic sense that uh, the environment, the politics, the social uh, uh, politics and, and the economy needs to be steered at least uh, uh, in, in some parts, in some places where it's possible in a different way. We, we, we cannot plant a seed in a ground that is done to grow something else or to not grow plants at all. All right. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Hope your family is well. Um, yes. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Cheers, Rafael. Bye.